And what that means for us today is, no matter what we face, there's nothing that can take the love that we see in the cross of Jesus Christ away from us. Nothing can make that fade. Nothing can make that fail. Nothing can diminish it. It is always there. And so we celebrate on this Valentine's Day that we know what love is because God loved us first. We're able to love each other because of the love that God has had for us. And so we're going to sing a few familiar choruses here that are really, most of them, love songs that, uh, to God. And I want you to think as we sing these about what it is that you love about God. What it is that you want to tell God, thank you for loving me in this way. I love you because of this. I love this about you. I just want you to prayerfully think those things and, and give them to God in your heart as we sing these songs today.
take a moment and prayerfully, as we thought about how we love God and how He's loved us, I want you to think for a moment about the things about yourself that cause you to believe that you are not loved by Him. To confess in this moment what it is that keeps you from fully receiving the love of God, whether it's sin in your life, whether it's pain from your past, whether it's circumstances you go through, what is keeping you from saying, that's my identity, that I am loved by the God of all creation, and that there's nothing that can ever make that fail in my life. Just pray and confess that right now. What is it that's keeping you from knowing God's full love today? to us can ever change that about who we are. That your cross stands before us. That there's a reminder that there's nothing you won't do. That there's nothing you won't give. That there's nothing you won't sacrifice for us to know the depth of your love. So may we be filled with it today. May we allow nothing in our lives. Nothing that we feel. Nothing that we know. No pain. No hurt. Nothing. Keep us from being filled and changed by your love. May we hear and know of that love today. May we allow ourselves to be filled by it so that it can overflow from our hearts that we might love each other as you have loved us. We pray today that you speak to us loudly through your word of your love and the call for us to love one another in the same way. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Is it? Okay. That's out. A couple, couple of announcements for you as we, uh, before we move into the word here. Maybe. Um, as you see, some of our electric is working and not working. So if you're cold today, it's not you. It's us. The furnace here isn't working. So, um, yeah. We'll uh, hopefully have all that fixed by next week. And so all the lights work. We're working on a number of things to, uh, with our technology to begin to help us connect better with each other. And so not only do we want you to look forward in the coming weeks to uh, some of the things that we might be doing differently or new, um, but if you want to be a part of that and you want input in that or want to know how you can help with that, let me know. That might not be your uh, forte, and that's okay, but we know we're all called as we're gifted in certain ways to to use whatever we have to help build the kingdom. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to be a part of that process, to let me know, and uh, I can help you know how you can help us as we move forward in those ways. <clears throat> also, as we're talking about one another, and I, I felt like we, we can't not do anything for the one another's in our lives while we begin to explore these passages through Lent, 
of what God has called us to do and how he's called us to live with one another. So in the foyer, because we don't do bulletins, but there's, um, there's these sheets, these half sheets, front and back. There's two different ways that we're going to begin to just collect some things to try and help some of the people who are in need in our area. On one side, the schools, if you don't know this, we have people that work for the United Way in every school. And they help our families in need. And they told me this week that they're in desperate need of, number one, hoodies. Because um, kids, because of COVID, don't have lockers, so they don't wear coats to school. And so if they don't have enough hoodies to wear different ones every day, they're wearing the same ones, so they don't have anything to wear to keep them warm. So they're collecting hoodies to give away. They can be new, they can be used, as long as they're in good shape. And then pants, uh, particularly like athletic pants, joggers, not like baseball pants, but like that you know, not jeans, not something with a button. Uh, athletic pants, joggers, and then leggings for girls. They can be used, they can be, as long as they're in good shape, they can be new, any of that. So that's not like, there's not a deadline on that. We'll be collecting those in the coming months to help them restock because they don't have anything to help uh, the kids that need it right now. So if you have those, you can bring them to me, you can bring them in and put them in the foyer, just bag them up um, so we can take care of them. They don't collect them because they're afraid they're going to get too many and they can't wash them and do that. And we're going to do all that for them as churches and then just bring them to them all organized and ready to go. So if you have any of those items you want to bring in, please do. On the other side, we're going to have a toiletry drive during Lent. And we've done this before, but this year we're doing it so that we can stock up here so that we as a church can directly help families in need uh, when, when they come to me or when we know of them that... These kind of things, as I helped with the food cover last week, there were people who were foregoing food so they could get body wash because they don't have any way to wash themselves either. They can't afford that. So this is a way for us to say, here's things that are hard for you to get a hold of, things that you may not get at a food cover, things that we have that we can give to you and help you out. So it's just a, a full list of the kind of things. There's things I probably forgot. You can bring those in too. We'd like to just make baskets that we can give to those families when, when we come across them uh, in need and bless them in, in this way. So just a couple ways that you can think about giving back in a very practical, easy way for us to show the love of Christ to the one and others in our community. It's a couple ways for you to think about. Now, kids, I gave you guys sheets of paper, right? A couple special sheets of paper. So these sheets of paper... Um, are called litmus, litmus tests. You, most of you are older might remember this in school. I don't know if you still do this in school or not, if you've seen it. But I remember this when I was in school. And it's, litmus test is used to tell whether a liquid is an acid or a base. Now, I'm not going to explain that to you because I'm not a science teacher, right? But basically, there's something called a pH level, okay? And so if you're... you're parents or in your house, you're getting your water, doesn't taste right. Somebody might come in and do a test on your water and they're going to do a pH test. And if that number's too high, what that means is there might be some bleach in your water. Okay? So something's called a base has this high pH. Something that's an acid has a low pH. So, something you might know like bleach. You guys have smelled that and seen that? That's what we call a base. Uh, battery acid in your cars. Those, these are extremes. These are strong ones of each. But sometimes scientists need to figure out whether these are bases or acids because if they mix them together, it has to do with the molecules inside and they can react and they can blow up or you know, have some bad reaction. So they need to know. All right. So they have better ways to test than this. But what these, these papers do is simple. If you got a blue one, I gave you a blue and a red one, right? The blue ones, if you take them home, blue ones don't have anything on them, so you can take those home. Blue is easy to remember. If it's blue, it's a base, right? B and B. If it turns red, it's an acid. So if you take this home, and there's some things that you have that are safe, that are acids, like you might have orange juice or lemon juice, right? Something like that would have acid in it. Kids, if you put this in, in that, it'll change color to red, and the stronger the acid is, the stronger the red will be. Or... Get, get a bottle of pop, a can of pop. It'll probably have acid in it too. If you put this in there, it'll probably change this red. Now you can only use it once. You can't dip this in everything. If you want, you have extra things you want to test it on, let me know. I've got more of them. You can, you can take them home. You can take them home, put that blue one in 
and pop orange juice or something. And watch, it'll, it'll change colors. It'll turn to red, all right? Luke, I'll give you one to take home too. I know you like magic. I like to play with it. No? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Are you waiting? You're here? All right, good. <laughs> the red ones, I wrote something on for you, right? I wrote a memory verse, a scripture verse. Okay? And I wrote this scripture verse for this reason. There is a litmus test for Christians. And that verse is the litmus test. Alright? This is what I'm going to tell everybody today. There's something that tests whether or not you really believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. And this Bible verse says this is the proof. It's like this is if we could dip one of these into our hearts and stir it around and come up. If it changed color, it would show that if we had this, that we really believe in and follow Jesus. Now, you guys, I, I challenge you to read the verse. So let's see if, you're, if you read it and shout it out. What is the litmus test? What do we have to have that proves that we believe in Jesus? We follow Jesus. What is it? Okay. Love. Right? Love. It says it real clearly in that verse. Read John 13, 34, and 35. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Jesus will be on the cross the next day. This is one of the last things that he ever says to his disciples. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus says that's the proof. That's your litmus test. We can't really look into somebody's heart. But he says if you look at somebody's life and you see that they love people. We talked last week about all who the people are that we're supposed to do things like love to. The one and others. It's our church family. The people that God gives us to share this time with each other. Our family at home. Everybody else. Everybody at school. Everybody at work. Everybody at the grocery store. And then even finally we saw the people that we don't like. The people that annoy us. The people we want nothing to do with. We're supposed to, to do all these things for them too. And the first one on that list is to love. Because, it's the first one on the list, because God tells us, this is what proves. If you follow me, if you believe in me, if you really have Jesus in your hearts, you will love one another. Jesus says it again. This is in John 15. Because we might ask, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do I know if I have that kind of love. This is the same time that Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is a long teaching he gives them. Same time, right at the Last Supper, John 15, verse 12, he says, This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. He said that before, right? How are we supposed to love? We love each other the way that Jesus loved us. Well, how did Jesus love us? He answers that next. It's the next verse. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. No greater love. The way that we really see love is if we are willing to lay down our lives for each other. Now, we talk about a lot of different descriptions of God's love. That it's reckless, that it's amazing, that, that it's radical, that it's unconditional. We have all these words, and they're all true, because the Bible tells us God's love is deep and wide. It's a lot of things, and it impacts us in a lot of ways. But there's one thing, one descriptional word that is the most important for us to understand about Jesus' love, and that is that it is sacrificial. It always gives up. It always gives of itself. We know what love is because of what Jesus has done for us. Because he gave himself up for us, right? And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to show you how I love. I'm going to show you what my love looks like. And then I want you to love each other the same way. Now, Jesus isn't specifically telling us that we have to die for each other. Like he died for us. But he is telling us that we do have to die to ourselves in certain ways. We have to give things up. We no longer can be the most important thing in our world. That's what it means to love one another. 
So the question is, how, how do we really do that? How do I, if I'm not literally giving up my life, how do I give myself up for my friends, for my church family, for my family, for all the one another's, for the people I don't like? How am I to give myself up daily for them? There's 16 one another verses in the New Testament. And I think those verses help. We're not going to look at all of them today. But we're going to look at about eight of them. And they're going to help define what this means. All right? They're going to help explain what this love really looks like. So it's not just some general word, okay, I'm supposed to love. Okay, I'm supposed to give up. I want you to hear these words and be asking myself, how am I, how is, am I supposed to give myself up in this way for my church family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my family at home, the people in my life, or the people I don't like in my life, or I don't want to be in my life. So let's start looking at it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. This describes our love for one another as sincere. Listen to what Peter writes. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. The word for sincere means genuine, without hypocrisy. That means it's real. He demand, Jesus tells us and shows us what this love looks like. He demands self-sacrificing love. But our, lo our motive in that love can't be because God told me to. Our motive in love can't be because I hope I get something back from you, like a transactional love. My motive in love can't be for me to get anything out of it. My motive has to be sincere, genuine. It means there has to be something that has changed in my heart. We'll talk about this a number of times. The saying is this. It is our vertical relationship with God that changes how we live horizontally with one another. So when it's, I love because I have to, I'm living on this horizontal plane. I'm living with you. But really, it's when my focus is on God. And my focus is on who He is and what He's done that I am able to live with all of you in the right way. When my focus is on you or on me down here on this plane, I'm going to mess it up, right? Sincere, genuine love is a result of a sincere, genuine relationship with God. And there is no other way to have that kind of love other than to be in that relationship with Him. So your love has to be sincere. Laying down our lives for one another comes from a sincere, genuine love that flows from a sincere, genuine relationship with God. That verse gave us another answer to this question. The second part of the verse says, love each other deeply with all your heart. Now, when we hear that word deeply, that's a word we might use to describe our love. Romans uses that to describe God's love. And we think that word means, like, there, there's roots to it, right? You can't, it's, you can't pull it up easily. It's got some foundation. But that's not actually what the word Paul uses means. It's actually an athletic word. And that word means to give all of your effort, to use all of your might. So think of when you might hear a coach tell an athlete they have to dig deeper, right? What do they mean when they say that? What they mean is this. What you're doing is hard. And I can see you're out of energy, Right? You've already been in the game or in the race for a long time, and you're starting to run on empty, but you've got more within you. Dig down within your strength. Dig down within what you have. You have the ability and the capability to keep going. Right? That's the description of God's love, which means this. That to have the kind of love that Jesus has for us, you have to work at it. It's going to be hard. You've got to dig down deep within the, the strength and energy that you have. It's never going to be simple and easy. Nobody looks at the cross and says, I bet that was easy. Right? It took work. It took effort. And that's the kind of love that we're to have for each other. We have to dig deep to find that kind of love. Laying down your life in love is going to take work. Number three, Romans 12.10. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Now, affection is a word that we would use, you know, on Valentine's Day to describe how we would show each other love, right? And we, even if it's a, a friendship, we have an embrace. 
we, we have some way physically that we show affection for one another. Obviously, that's not what Paul's talking about. All right? So what does he mean? This word for affection here is two different words. The first is the word for friendship, and the second is the word for loving a family member. So what this word actually means, and Paul kind of creates this, is it is talking about friends that we love as if they are family. People that we feel so close to. This is why we describe the church family as brothers and sisters. We're so close that it's if, as if we are family. And so what Paul is saying is how do we do that? Second part, take delight in honoring each other. And what that word he uses there means is this. We always give preference to the other. So we love each other as if we're family by always looking to what the other person wants and needs above our own. It means if there's one of us is going to succeed, I'm rooting for you to succeed. If one of us is going to get something good out of this, I want you to get the good and not me. That's how Jesus loved us. And that's how he calls us to love each other. That's how we show affection. Not, it's not an embrace. It's not sitting close to each other. Christian affection is shown in how I give preference to you over myself. So laying down our lives for one another is desiring the best for everyone else above yourself. Fourth, Romans 13, 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. Now, I said just a little bit ago that you shouldn't love people out of obligation. And then Paul says right here, you have an obligation to love one another. So am I, was I contradicting scripture? I want you to understand what this obligation is. And I think it's important for us to understand this in order for us to know how to love each other. I'm not obligated to love you. I don't owe you anything. You don't owe me anything. My obligation is that I'm not paying back some debt my love isn't because of something that you've done. My obligation is to God. And I have a covenant relationship with Him, right? I, I got my wife a Valentine's gift today, right? I could have bought that because I was obligated to, right? I have to, or else I'm going to be in trouble, right? I wouldn't be, but maybe would I? No, no, okay. <laughs> I didn't buy it because I'm obligated to. I bought it because the relationship I have with my wife and my love for her, my obligation that I have to her, makes me want to do loving things for her, right? My obligation is not to do things, is not to show her love. My obligation is to my relationship with her. I'm in a covenant relationship with her that obliges me to live with her in a certain way. That's our obligation. We're supposed to be in a covenant relationship with God. This vertical relationship that changes how we live horizontally. I'm obligated to God in that relationship, so I'm obligated to His Word, which tells me what? In order to live out all the commands that I give you, I can sum it up out. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Our loving each other flows out of our obligation to God in our relationship with Him. He's who our obligation is to. I don't love you because I have to. That's what we're saying. You can't say, okay, God, I don't want to love Him, but I will because I have to. Nobody wants that kind of love, do they? Nobody's clamoring for that. What we're saying is, God, I, I am obligated to you forever, and you and who you are have changed me, and your Holy Spirit has filled my life, and because of that, this love flows out of me, it pours out of me. We're obligated to God. So laying down our lives for one another flows out of a right relationship with God and our obligation to Him. Because we're filled with that, what we're told next is 5, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. That love is always supposed to be growing and increasing. You never have enough love. You never like reach a limit. 
He promises us, if you love the way I've called you to love, it is going to grow, it's going to increase, it will overflow. It will be a flood that spills out of you. If we love the way that God has called us to love, the way we love each other and how we love one another will continue to grow. How many people that we love will continue to grow. Our love will increase in every way possible for love to increase. Laying down your life in love means love is growing and increasing, never diminishing, never stopping. Love is shown. 1 Peter 5.14 Greet one another with Christian love. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Now your version might say, you greet one another with a holy kiss. There's four different verses, verses from Paul that say, Greet one another with a holy kiss. These are not COVID-friendly verses, right? We cannot do that right now. It's, it's fi finally something COVID has given us something that we're okay with, right? Why is Paul saying this? Is he saying that this, this kiss, this embrace, this way of greeting one another means something? No. What he's saying is, I want you to show your love to one another. I want there to be a way that you guys can really show each other in love you greet each other in a way that says, I, I love you. I love who you are, and I, I want you to be a part of my life. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, but we, Paul's writing to this church, and says, we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Love is not a metaphor. Love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. In Christian love is something that you see. It is shown. When we love one another, you know it. You see it. It is practical. It is felt. How are you showing people that you're not telling them? Don't tell people that you love them. Show people that you love them. Jesus didn't just tell us that he loved us, did he? No, he gave us this cross. He gave us the cross so that he can show us, I didn't just tell you that greater love has no one to lay down than to lay down their lives for friends. He went and did the thing. He did it for us. He showed his love to us and is calling us to show our love for each other. Laying down our lives in love will always show something to one another. Next, Galatians 5.13. It says, you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Serve one another in love. It's interesting. Literally what Paul says is, use your freedom to become a slave to loving one another. Again, we're not obligated. He's not saying God has loved you, so now you've got to do this. You've got to love one another. No, he's freed you, so now you make the choice to give yourself up for one another, to serve one another. Service never gains anything for me. Service always gives, period. Service is always about the other and never about myself. That's what we're called to, to give our lives to serving all these one another's. If we keep going, the next two verses in Galatians 5, they highlight it even more. They tell us how not to do it. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Paul lays out this simple warning to the Galatians. You cannot love one another and destroy one another at the same time. You can't say you love somebody and then your words and deeds hurt them. And as I read these, these verses, I thought, man, what better description of what we see going on in our nation and in our churches and among people right now than this biting and devouring each other. Doing whatever they can, whatever they can say to hurt, to take away. We all seem to be walking away with teeth marks from all of our interactions with one another. And what the scripture tells us is when we do that, Love is not in us. You can't do both. Because love always builds up and never tears down. Love always creates and never destroys. Love always, it, it doesn't look to get into arguments. It doesn't look to, to say, what can I say next to make this person look bad or to show I'm smarter or to show I'm right? It means that we always forgive. We never anger quickly. 
It means that we throw away things like resentment and jealousy and anger and angst and disappointment. It means that we let other people get the credit. We let other people tell the story. We let other people get the bigger slice. We let other people get the spotlight. Love always gives. Love never takes. There's no better description for what Jesus did for you. Because what did he get out of the cross? Scars. Right? But nothing for himself. Everything he got was for you. Giving our lives in love means we always give, we never take. Now, some people might say, this sounds great, but it's hard in a pandemic. Number one, because I'm stressed, I'm worried, I've got all the all these things have just gone on so long and I'm just over. Number two, I can't actually be around people that much, right? It's harder to show people love. Do you know, throughout history, pandemics have been opportunities for Christians to show God's love. It's a historical fact. The first hospitals in Europe were created because Christians saw plagues happening and said this, if we do nothing or we do anything that causes this plague to spread, it is the same as us being guilty of murder. That's what they got out of Scripture. So they built hospitals to save people instead of fight and make them sick. In the second century, there's a plague in, in the Roman Empire. It took out 25% of the Roman Empire. And Christians went and when it cared for people, they went to people and they used it to say, stop believing that this plague is happening because your gods are angry with you. And start understanding this plague is happening as a reflection of a broken creation. A broken relationship with a loving creator. And they were able to tell them about a God who loved them even in the midst of a plague. And the word of God spread and the kingdom grew as people were dying. In the 4th century, the historians tell us about another plague that hit in Rome. And they wrote that Christians ensured that good was done to all men, not merely to the household of faith. So we have these writings from the Emperor, Emperor Julius, who was annoyed. He called uh, the Christians Galileans. And he was so annoyed that Christians would take care of people who disagreed with them. That they went out of their way to find people who didn't believe the same as them and took care of them. And here's what they show. In that plague, towns that had churches had half the death rate of towns without them. Because Christians were so committed to taking care of one another around them. 1527. Martin Luther is in Wittenberg, Germany, and the bubonic plague hits, and everybody runs. Whenever, I mean, imagine... Coronavirus came and everybody moved out of town. That's what the bubonic plague was like. But Martin Luther didn't go anywhere. He stayed. And him staying caused his daughter to get the bubonic plague and she died. And so he wrote a tract. Because that's, I mean, that's like what an article or a blog post or whatever it was that day. And it was titled, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. And here's what he wrote. We die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. This plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. We can use our hardships and our pains and our difficulties. We can use pandemics as excuses that it's too hard to love the way Jesus loved us. But the reality is this, friends. These are opportunities to show people who God is. They are opportunities for us to love in a way to put skin on God. Right? God did not want us to love in a way that was metaphorical, that was emotional. He wanted us to love in a way that people could see it and know it. That's why he gave us the cross. Because every time we look at this, we know what God's love looks like. We, have, we don't just have a description. We don't just have a metaphor. He showed us what to do. 
And so now he's calling us to love each other in a way that shows people who God is, that shows what his love looks like. Even in the midst of the hardest of things, the hard things become the crosses on which we die on for each other, on which we give up our lives, on which we can say, greater love has no one than this, that I will give up my life for you, for my one another's. All these things, sincerity, genuineness, affection, effort, action, service, giving, the increasing measure of all these things, they show people Jesus because Jesus showed us what it means to love. He showed us what it should look like in our lives. Sometimes it's going to mean something small. Sometimes it's going to be insignificant. Sometimes it won't cost you all that much. And sometimes it'll cost you everything. Sometimes you'll have to give up the things that you cherish the most so that others can come to know that God loves them too. Who is God calling you to lay your life down for today? How are they calling you to show a sincere, genuine faith? Not just feel it, show it. Not so that they know that you love them, but so that they know there's a God in heaven that loves them no matter what they're going through, no matter what they face. Who's God calling you to love that way today? I want you to take a moment and just ask God to speak to, the, to your heart. And I want you to really ask yourself this. If God brought this litmus paper today and started to dip it into your heart, what would it show? If he applied it to your life, would it show beyond a shadow of doubt that you are filled with the love of God that proves that you are one of His disciples, that proves that you live for and follow Him? Or would it show something else? Would your selfishness change the color? Would your need to find what you want change that color? Or what would it show? Who is God calling you to love in a way that will prove that you are a follower of Jesus Christ in them, in a way that will show them God and His immense, amazing love. Take a moment and pray for that today. Ask for God to show you the ways in your life that you haven't been loving, the people in your life to whom you haven't been loving. Show you maybe some of the things that, that we looked at in Scripture today they are just weak points. They're, they're not what we're good at because none of us are perfect at love. We all have to grow in it. It's increasing every day. Lord, I need an increase in my love. Ask for Him to show you that. And then we'll come to him and we'll close with the song and prayerfully and just thank him that he loved us in this way, that he's called us to love one another. Let's take a moment and pray. Father God, we come to you today. We recognize that there's nothing about ourselves that will ever be worthy of your love. There's nothing we can ever do that can deserve what you've done for us. But that we're forgiven because you were forsaken. We're forgiven. We're saved. We're loved today because of what you have done for us, because of who you are. And so today we ask that you would fill us with that amazing love. As we ask, how? How can God love me this way? Why would He love me that way? We see all the things in ourselves that should keep us from being loved. We recognize that your love is greater than those things. It's overcome those things. May our hearts be filled with that amazing love today. May we stand and sing and praise to you and proclaim it now that because of that love that you are our King, you are who we live for, you are who we follow today and forevermore. 
We pray that the people in our lives would see this love so that they can know how much you love them in the same way. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Stand with me today. We sing this amazing love. If you, you're convicted, you know, I, I don't know that love. My heart doesn't have that love. I'm not filled in that way. And I, I want to come into that right relationship with God that will change how I live with each other. Take this opportunity to ask for that change. You can come to the altar and pray. You can pray where, right where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. This is your opportunity to get right with Him and to have His love change you so that you can love Him the way He's called us to. And sing this amazing love today.
God's love. And may you that love overflow from your hearts and lives, that you would honor God with all that you are, with all that you do, with all that you say. May you go today loving one another as he has loved you. Go in peace.